a boss versus Dr. Hippie. Let's see what they had to say about each other. Talk to me about Dr. Hippie. I mean, he's tough because he has already been here and he has already proved himself that he's a good player. I didn't see him in the prelims because he was going home, but I just saw him in a short time when he won. And he generates roots on the board! Wow! You said! His emotions are there. And I can't help, I'm getting carried away. I'm as excited as he is. I'm afraid of him. I was expecting him to bring Prismage in this tournament. He didn't. I also expect him to bring uh, Rogue. He's the, the tougher from, from the rest, guys. He can come as many times as he wants here, but uh, I don't care. If I win this one, I don't care. He will have to come one more time again. Welcome back, everyone, to the final series of the of day one of the European Summer Championship. Oh, yeah. I'm Raven, joined, of course, by Subtle, partner in crime, at the moment, at least. Mm. And we have a really great series to finish off the day, in my opinion, at least. We've got Dr. Hippie versus Like a Boss, and a true sort of clash of personalities, I would say. Oh, yeah. I mean, are, uh, different backgrounds. You know, Dr. Hippie is the experienced player here. You know, he has major experience. He has HCT experience, having been to a championship before. Like a Baus, not quite on that level, but he does have the uh, the entire Greek community on his back, as we will find out a little bit later. Has a ton of support back in his home country. But yeah, personality-wise, <laughs> chalk and cheese. The, uh, the quiet, softly spoken, very sparing with his words, Dr. Hippie, up against the absolute bundle of energy that is like a boss yeah and we've seen that over the past couple of days as well just hanging out with the players like right. a boss he's just always in the middle of conversation always wants to talk about the game or even just general stuff and he's just you know always the the center i would say whereas dr b likes to just chill on the edge a little bit right. and just get involved when he feels he you know it warrants his attention i guess and what is super interesting to me is that both of the players have identified that personality clash and both of them have privately expressed <laughs> yeah. to us they have intentions to exploit that you know dr hippie is going to try and slow the game down as you see a picture that is like a uh, girlfriend and or fiance and or wife not quite sure where they stand and uh child who he says is a huge inspiration for him says that she brings him the good luck that he needs to uh, to, to play hearthstone so he's going to be relying on some support in spirit from his uh, his girlfriend and daughter but to finish the thought dr hippie says that he's going to try and slow the game down. There may be a lot of roping <laughs> yep. here. There may be a lot of... You turn know, one. Full 75-second turns, whereas you saw in Dr. Hippie's interview there, his media piece, where he said he's a little bit scared of Like a Boss's emotions. He doesn't really know how he quite react to that. And I think Like a Boss identified that and says he's going to try and play up the whole, you know, emotional side of the game. So there is a serious clash of styles here, both on and off the game board. Yeah, and we are starting with game one, Like a Boss versus Dr. Tippy. It's going to be Like a Boss's Zoo versus Dr. Tippy's Rogue as well. So this is a... Uh Quite an old matchup if you take mm. it all the way back. Two of the sort of longest standing Hearthstone decks in terms of overall style. Obviously, a few changes once we've had some expansions in standard, for example. But still, you know, the, the theory is almost the same. Yeah, and I, I spoke at some length with, with Like About about his lineup, and he said that Zoo was a deck that he felt like he had to bring as the fifth deck, but he didn't really trust it. He wanted to find something better, but he couldn't to fit with his lineup strategy. So he ended up with Zoo as a default fifth deck. So it's interesting here that the deck that he probably feels least secure in is what he's leading out with. Yeah, maybe just wants to try and just cash in on the early win, get it out of the way, yeah. forget about it, and then move on with the rest of the decks he's very comfortable with. But I also know that Dr. Tippy, known by far for his freeze mage play, his second most played class is Rogue. Yes. Like, he does not mess around with Rogue either. It's, uh, I would say, it's just below his Freeze Mage play games. Yeah, and this is uh, a little bit of an old school list here from Dr. Hippie. He's playing a list that was popularized by uh, Stan Sifka and my complexity teammate Super JJ, who. Uh, kind of came up with this one Argent Squire idea in, in, in Miracle Rogue because they, they generally just don't have anything to do on turn one a lot of the time. It's a, it's a spot that's been supplanted by Swashburglar recently mm -hmm. in a lot of decks, but Dr. Hippie going with this old school Argent Squire and the old school flavor is something that echoes throughout a lot of his deck lists. He's playing old school Token Druid, for example, as well, not bringing the, the more you know up-to-date Malagos version. But 
as I went on that extended story about Dr. Hippie's deck lineup, you can see there is absolutely no action from Hippie's side nope. of the board right now on turn one, and his decision mm. is uh, backstab a flame imp, play an Argent Squire, or none of the above. Yeah, so I was talking to uh, Dr. Hippie yesterday, and he told me about this strategy, and I was like, oh, you know, so you're going to rope a bit, and he was like, no, I am going to rope every single turn, and I know it will annoy him. It's like, okay, well, interesting to see, but he does have a pretty good turn. He can choose to backstab the uh, the imp if he wants to, but it looks like he wants to hold on for that. He has multiple options next turn of just coining out SI, and so right. far, Dr. Tippy's hand is looking pretty good, and, you know, like you said, this sort of old-school approach seems to be working out so far, just being able to get the Squire down early on. Yeah, Voidwalker here, really nice response to the uh, Argent Squire. Important pickup for like a boss that turn. If he'd have just had the Abusive Sergeant as his turn, it would have looked a little bit miserable. So the 1-3 the to wall out the 1-1 the one -one from making any efficient trades here is definitely a really big deal. But Dr. Hippie, for his part, has a, a pretty strong opening against Zoo. Honestly, he got that one Squire, and he also has access to the Coin SI7 agent play, which oh, is such really a huge nice. swing early against a Zoo deck. Yeah, and especially because we can see the follow-up as well. You know, the, the natural progression of how this game uh, may well play out is, like a boss plays, the Gang Boss on three, because it's a pretty good three drop. And then Dr. Hippie just has the opportunity to just sap because he'll be ahead on board and then just build on that. And a lot of the time, Zoo can't really come back from that if Rogue's ahead this early on. Yeah, I mean, definitely breaking up the backstab SI7 agent combination here and you know using the coin, which is a tool that can be useful as the game goes on. It's it's not an automatic decision, but because of that line that you uh, you just elucidated with the with the sap on the three drop, which is the primary target, right? Or quite is sometimes there's sea giants and sometimes sapping a doom guard is okay, but you know the doom guard is just going to come straight back at you the next turn. So the three drops are quite often the premium sap targets in the deck. Yeah, and it's going to be really difficult for like a boss, and we see this uh, rope strategy more importantly playing out. And I'm going to probably more so, <clears throat> excuse me, than any matchup we've seen. I'm going to watch the player cams just a little bit more as well, just yeah. to see who is getting to who more, because Dr. Tippy looks pretty chill, whereas like a boss looks not, I was going to say more focused than normal. I, I don't mean that as in terms of, you know, an insult, but more sort of relaxed than you would normally feel, probably because he's on the you know back end of a rough match so far. And again, I'm sure Dr. Hippie is going to consider his options here, but <laughs> now is the time that he can just turn the switch on the Zoo deck and put Zoo in that position that they do not want to be in, which is having to consider defensive plays. And he can do that right now. Sap, trade the 3-3 into the 1-2, jam a cold blood onto his Argent Squire and just start getting in there. Yeah, because, you know, Zoo doesn't really have a good way to just deal the one damage outside of a peddler into a coil. So, right. so, well, so what, what so are you going to do? Soul fire your one exactly. health Argent Squire? The, the health is completely insignificant, especially compared to the fact it's gaining the damage off the cold blood. So, you know, not too much of a surprise to see this turn. You just fill it out as much as possible. He's probably going to have the mana to dagger up and start being able to use that to leverage the advantage as well going forward. So, like a boss, definitely not having a great time of it at the moment. And I, I just really love the sap on the three drop. It just cements the advantage Hippie's gained so far. It does so many things for him here. Like not only does it, you know, start putting on the pressure to Zoo's life total, where you know Zoo's life total is one of their biggest vulnerabilities. You can really pressure that heavily, but it also creates the situation <laughs> where if Imgang Boss was to come down again, you just automatically have an amazing trade on the board with the five-one into it. So you can just maintain pressure that way. Sap number two being picked up is so huge here for Hippie because now that's the one turn he needs. He can sap the 2-4, he can double trade with the dagger and the 3-2 into the Argent Squire. And then from there, he's just curving into Drake yeah. perfectly. And, and we can see as well from like a boss's hand, it's just, it's going to ruin him. Because yep. then if he has to play Doomguard, well, that's one minion. He can only attack one of his opponent's minions with that. He'll still have one left. And then he'll discard an Argus and the Im Gang boss. Like, horrible minions to discard because they're actually going to be MVPs in this matchup going forward. Absolutely. But he's also pressured enough, as you said, on the life total that you, I feel like you kind of just have to Doomguard. Yeah, the, the power of this new Zoo deck is that with the addition of, of Malkazar's Imp being able to, you know, draw cards for each card that you discard, you essentially cycle through your deck to the power cards more often because Zoo is a deck where in the mid game, you know, some of your decks are just, some of your cards, sorry, are just significantly more powerful than others. You know, your Doom Guards, your Soul Fires, your Darkshire Councilmans, your Defenders of Argus, this is what you really want to pick up. What you don't want is the situation where you draw the other way around and your Doom Guard just ends up discarding those power cards for you. Yeah, the old school Doom Guard plays. 
That actually just causes more trouble sometimes. Yep. But we'd see the Flame Imp pretty pointless as a draw for like a boss. He could he could choose to go with the Gang Boss and the Flame Imp, but one, that's three more damage. Mm -hmm. So that would be 11 guaranteed sort of damage across both turns. And also, it just doesn't really gain too much. It's just too slow, I feel. Yeah, I mean, it, it just doesn't... It puts a three health taunt on the board, even if he goes with the Argus play, like Flame Imp into Argus, which just doesn't do anything. The 3-1 just trades directly into it. So, yep, the Doomguard line seems to be the only line that makes any sense, but this is just a free Azure Drake turn for Dr. Hippie here. He's just nailed down as much early game tempo as he needs, and he can just happily make this, this you know, easily trade up for him on the board, 3-1 into the remainders of the Doomguard, and just continue to curve out. Yeah, and also uh, at this point, the, the outs for like a boss are very, very small, right? Because Dr. Hippie knows it's an uh, gang boss in hand. Mm -hmm. So he knows there's no chance of like a soul fire into silverware golems or something like that, you know, to have uh, any chance to just battle back right. onto the board. And he knows that's not going to happen at point. this point. So, you know, Dr. Hippie's just, as you said, just continuing to be in a great position. And he's probably, for the rest of the game, going to stay one minion ahead. Yeah, this is the position you want to be in against Zoo. If, if if you create board tension against Zoo, they can almost always break that in their favor. They're, they're the deck that plays all the buffs, all the combat tricks, you know, all the power pumpers that they need to just make more favorable trades than you can possibly cope with. But if you're able to get ahead of them, just have more minions on the board, that is a huge benefit. And if that, if that number of minions is any number against zero, then they are in a mess. Yeah, this is looking pretty horrible for Lycabas. He's just... Just playing whatever he can, but as I said, Hippie's just value of his hand, even though he can't guarantee to Gadget Zan into prep and cycle a big turn. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even need to particularly. He could just play Tomb Pillager, clear the 2-1 and dagger up again. You know, it's just it's a completely valid turn and then use the coins if the Tomb Pillager dies to then have a much better Gadget Zan turn after. If he doesn't just already finish the game by then. Yep. I mean, I, d I definitely like dagger down the 2-1. Tomb Pillager seems like a, a given. The only question is where you send the Drake. And I personally would love to see this Drake going downtown. I want to put my opponent to 11 right now yeah. and just really start ramping up the pressure. Because it, like a boss is at a point where he has to tap to try and keep up in terms of the board. And if he keeps tapping and you just go aggressive, he will just die. That's normally how life tap works when you have two L. So I really like the pressure. And... Also, what, what are the punishes from leaving in Gambos up versus trading? Like, are, are there that many? And it would have to be something plus Argus. Like, Argus would be necessary to, to ramp up the, the health so it could pick up a value trade, and then he would need additional power on top of that. Okay. That <laughs> changes many, many things. Yeah, so two it, cards when you have a, only two cards other in hand in this. One of them, Silverware Golem, feels pretty reasonable. Yeah, it, it might not be enough. It probably won't. You know, Dr. Hippie's got so secure with his early game here, and he has just a strong Gadgetan turn available to him in the future. But this is the kind of draw that, that like a Bows needed. He, he, you know, just, just drawing regular vanilla Zoo minions was not going to get the job it, done. He needed to do something above and beyond. And, you know, the, the Silverware Golem discard synergy is pretty much the strongest thing you can do in this build of Zoo. Exactly. It was the only, probably the only draw or combination of draws that was going to give him any chance at this point in the game. Yep. But even with that, Dr. P still has Gadget Zan prep and then potentially a, a not prep coin in that order, of course. But, you know, potentially a coin to play around with as well, depending on how the turn plays out. And he's actually going to wait and just, I guess, just play the silverware golem out and trade into the drink. I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of this play. I, I, it, whenever you're you're spending mana on Silverware Golem, I, I, I tend to think something has gone wrong. But I understand that the Drake is a huge threat, and just leaving that up on board, you know, because if you if you Doom Guard, you probably want to like Doom Guard into the healthy minion to, yeah. to leave the the smaller minion available that that doesn't pick up. You know, you don't want the Tomb Pillager just to get a free trade into your three three, for example. And uh, so I can understand like the the threat of the Drake leaving it around there is a big deal. But I just I I feel like you needed that big swing turn to at least have any hope in this game. Yeah. So do you now, as Dr. Hippie, consider actually just Tomb Pillage into Van Cleef and continue to go? Because the prep, you know, is actually... Dr. Hippie's gone very heavy on minions this game. He's not really drawn too many spells at all, so the odds on the prep side kind of spell is pretty high. But you could just guarantee a wider board versus Zoo yep. with only a 3-3 three, three to, you know, like you know, try and even threaten your board. And one of those is a silverware golem that you saw from hand as opposed to being pulled out. So there's one less card yet again that can create a big swing turn. Yeah, completely agree. There's no need to do anything fancy just yet. Just keep developing the board, uh, keep yourself ahead. And now when these Tomb Pillagers just die through, through natural causes when they eventually will, 
Um, you're, you're able to start your Gadgetan turn then, but for now, just continue dominating the board. And uh, yeah, I think this is a wise pickup from from like a boss just taking the the Voodoo Doctor over the Malkazar's Imp because you know you actually you have to actually discard yeah, cards yeah. from the Malkazar's Imp to be able to draw more. So it actually wouldn't have done anything for him in that situation. Yeah, but I can imagine the uh, post-mortem of the Tomb Pillagers. Yes, he died of natural causes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the Doom Guard does actually just clear off the Tomb Pillager there. And now, Gadget Zan, two coins, prep. I mean, Dr. Hib is going to have a whale of a turn this time. He is, and this time he is not roping. He understands no. he is not going to put himself in the position so where he has to react late to a Gadgetzan turn. The thing I'm getting out of this is Dr. Tippy just lied to me. Yeah. He told me he's he going to rope every, every turn. turn. Those yeah. were his words. Okay. I'm, I personally am disappointed. As am I. I thought we'd get more time to chat. But, you know, Dr. Tippy just ruined it. But we'll see this Gadgetzan turn as he goes into the Farsi and their side. Oh my god, so many options now. I mean, it's he's got a board clear. Shadow yeah. Strike, SI7, dagger down the 2-1, just back in complete dominance, and that's if a more appealing option doesn't appear off the Gadgetzan cycle, which it doesn't. So I'm sure we're going to see the SI7 come down here, and again, just since, what, turn three, the Rogue has been ahead on this board, and it just hasn't even looked like the Zoo And also as well, here. you know, the health advantage is big as it is, and then a Farseer comes down to, you yeah. know, it doesn't sound like a lot being three health, but, you know, it can make a huge difference, actually, and there is going to be the first game, and Doc Tippy takes a very convincing win versus, like a boss, his Warlock, so struggled with that one overall, but we'll be back shortly with the next game of this series. So stick around, guys. How is the, the Hearthstone community like in Greece? Is it big or are there a lot of passionate players? Yeah, they're all passionate. Like. We're screaming to each other like in a, in a LAN tournament and someone is uh, top decking, there's going to be a fight. <laughs> there's going to be a fight, man. <laughs> what would it mean for the, the entire Greek Hearthstone community if a, if a Greek player like yourself won the Europe Championship? Like, I can show you in my phone how many messages I have. Like Everyone is telling me you need to win this. They're already organizing, like, I don't know, some group ups in net cafes or in their home to watch the game. Does that motivate you or does that make you feel a lot of pressure? I don't know. I, I want to win it, but if I don't, guys, chill. <laughs> Do you think that Greek Hearthstone is going to be a big thing in the future, especially with you qualifying for a championship? Yeah, every month they're like, at least four to five Greeks people in the top 100. So I think that's good. Yeah, we have too many good players. They just need uh, something more. And there we see the two things that Like a Boss is actually playing for right now. One, his daughter, and the other hand, the championship itself. So everything to play for, for Like a Boss here. Yeah, and as, as we saw in the in the media piece there, there's a third thing. He has really is fit carrying the, the weight of expectations of the yeah. Greek Hearthstone scene on his back. And he is very much, you know, a community leader in that scene. He was... Uh, showing me uh, earlier yesterday that he's actually you know, coded an app that's basically just like a, a Greek Hearthstone hub that you know oh, consolidates okay. all the streams in the same place and does news and tournament results and all that kind of stuff. So he is really looked up to as a, as a figure in the Greek scene. So um, there is there's definitely a third factor at play here. He has a lot of things motivating him to to try and move forward to BlizzCon here, but there is a a, a stony faced uh, opponent blocking his path right now in Dr. Hippie, who has his own motivations in making his way to BlizzCon. Yeah, as we go into game two, Dr. Hippie is 1-0 up versus Like a Boss, and it is going to be Dr. Hippie's Druid versus Like a Boss's Hunter. So I actually think this matchup is pretty good for the Hunter. I think mm. you can just pressure them out so fast yep. that Druid is now slowed down to, to such an extent that if Hunter curves, one, as we can see, 1-2 one, one, at least so far for like a boss, you can just overpower them. The removal is not fast enough combined with the death rattles of the Hunter. Yeah, the death rattles are a, a huge deal because, you know, classically, you know, everyone looked at Druid and said, Druid is a, is a class that struggles to remove minions. That's not 
quite the case anymore because they're playing very, very spell heavy, removal mm. heavy decks these days. But still, they just they don't interact well with sticky death rattle minions, of which there aren't too many removing in the game since Nax Ramus rotated out. But the one class that does still have access to them, you know, Kindly Grandmother, Infested Wolf, Savannah High Main, it's almost become the identity of the yep. Hunter class to be the death rattle class. And also that, combined with the other removal weakness for Druid, is wide boards. Yep. Like, they can probably deal with one minion, even, like, you can probably deal with a can, like, we reasonably okay but when, when when a board goes like that wide of death rattles it just becomes way too much to deal with but see hippie is running the ancient of wars in this list and the mulch but uh, he's got to get there i think that's the the key issue here he's gonna get to the late game and not just be dead to hero powers or any burns such as kill command because i feel like when you play against druid you can be aggressive and then even if the big taunts come up and you don't have cards like deadly shot or anything to actually just right. uh, remove them you can actually just keep hitting hero power and try not to die and that actually works quite often versus druid yeah, I completely agree. There's one, there's one deadly shot in the in the hunter list, so that's a, a potential answer to a huge wall. And uh, Doctor Hippie right now just staring at innovate. No, no persistent ramp up until that Maya Keeper. But he may just be considering how early he wants to get that Maya Keeper out right now. But I, yeah, I was gonna say, I think first and foremost, just address this fiery bat because you don't want the the state of the board to spiral out of control with beasts. You kind of want to answer them on a one one for one basis as long as you can up until turn four, just to make sure that that big Houndmaster blowout doesn't come down as long as you can so if there isn't a big pressure turn coming out here from from like a boss then dr hippie will probably just go ahead and innovate his my keeper on turn two having now dealt with the problem of that initial fiery bat and that's a pretty nice curve into the second uh my keeper now yeah i was just about to say actually like getting the my keeper out turn one wouldn't achieve anything especially no. against the fiery bat right the ramp doesn't ramp you into anything that dr hippie had available yeah. but now as you said it's going to curve out really well for him so he's going to be able to boost his mana up enough to try and get ahead of the hunter but like a boss does have a pretty decent follow-up as well he can just drop the squire in the following turn and tracking is a card we were discussing earlier today in the in in this list it's just so powerful in the fact you pretty much choose a win condition towards the late game yeah it's just tracking was has become an auto include in basically every hunter deck I play since Call of the Wild was yes. released because Call of the Wild is just such an insanely high power level card that you just want to draw it every game. You know, other cards be damned. I just want Call of the Wild on turn eight. That has to happen. Um, so tracking increases your consistency of being able to do that so much that it becomes such a big deal to have that card in your deck. Ooh. Barn seems good in time for turn four. The abusive seems really mm. good right now, though. Oh. Mm. That is a huge tempo turn if he just takes abusive sergeant right now. And his turn four can just be Howlmaster anyway if he dominates the board now. I think I like the abusive a little bit more that turn. It's a really tough decision, to be honest, because mm -hmm. I would always lean towards Barnes. I feel like the card in this deck is that powerful. Because sure. there's so many death rattles and... Let's be honest, if you bans out a high main, <laughs> you probably just, you know, won the game off the back of that mm -hmm. to a large extent. And also there are just way more minions as well to get off bans that feel pretty good. But as you said, the option was pretty likely is it would have forced removal on the second half of the grandmother. Or how master comes down, as he said. So, you know, merit to the both. I always I always lean towards bans, but it wouldn't have been particularly an issue if he didn't go for it. And she chooses here to trade into the 3-3 three, three preemptively, which does give up a lot more power on his board. It also makes it significantly easier for Dr. Hippie to sweep his board of beasts on this turn and deny the Houndmaster. But I guess if your line was to pick up Barnes as an alternate yeah. four mana play, you're not too concerned about your Houndmaster just yet. But still a little a little unusual with that turn. I personally would have liked the, the abusive line a little bit more and then uh, not quite sure what his thinking was after that with the, the, the preemptive trade. But Dr. Hippie now has a decision to make himself about whether he wants to try and deny turn four Houndmaster at pretty significant cost to himself, to his own development, or whether he just goes ahead and continues ramping up with the Maya Keepers. Yeah, I think the idea here was that if there was hero power into Wrath, he can clear whilst leaving the Maya Keeper up if he doesn't trade. Sure. So now he can't do that, right? So, you know, it's still a, it's a, it's a really bit wonky. It's a specific stretch. scenario yeah. to be playing It around. is a stretch, but as you said, he, picked, he did choose Barnes from tracking, which means he wasn't all in on having to play Houndmaster. Sure. Although now I like Houndmaster, of course. You get the value from that card whenever you can.
Yeah, absolutely. And like a boss looks like his uh, his thinking in this matchup is that he's very much prepared to go to the late game here because again, it looks like he's gonna you know not risk being punished here by and pick up the trade preemptively. Definitely seems what it looks like he's what he's considering here. Of course, if he was to go face, he can get punished by things like swipe, feral rage, even wrath plus hero power is is a lot more effective. Um, although the trade exposes him to swipe just yeah. as much, honestly. I was just gonna say, I think even looking at his hand. I would be more aggressive at this point because his hand is, you know, uh, Animal Companion, Barnes, Squire, right, all really great cards. But if he just like whiffs the next turn and suddenly it's just not looking as great to take it to the late game if the Druid stabilizes. But the trade is always going to happen, right? So I would just rather go face here. Get that four damage. Well, I mean, is the trade always going to happen? That's the question. Because if he was scared of Wrath last turn, if that's the world that you're saying we're living in, then he has to equally be scared of Wrath this turn, right? Because Wrath plus Hero Power then clears out his entire board. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Because um, he, he didn't see Wrath last turn, but it wasn't a great turn right. to Wrath Although because I guess of the trade. If he trades, then you just Wrath the 4-3 and Hero yeah. Power the 4-1 anyway. So it's much the same thing. So actually, I think there is very little punish to go face in that situation. So I think Legobals ended up with the right decision in that turn. Wow, and we can see Dr. Hippie now has actually two Ancient of Wars in hand yeah. and only one turn away from being able to play the first one. So this is looking actually you know, pretty rough. I think it's, if I was like a boss, I'd like to have done a bit more damage by now. Uh, to be able to pressure him there, but Dr. Hippie's done a pretty good job of negating that, getting that early Mai Keeper out, I think was really strong. Uh, I have really a strong here. So I have a question. How many, good, how many good mulch targets are there actually in a Hunter deck? Not many. There's not many, many, right? No, you're right. I'm like, trying to think. I'm like, you're not. You're not mulching a high main and feeling great about it. You're not mulching like infested yeah. wolves. You know, Call of the Wild mulch is going to be too slow. So yeah, I love seeing the mulch come out here. And what this means is that he's now using his three three. He has his three three consolidated on the board. So this three three can now defend his Ancient of War turn and give that Ancient of War maximum chance of sticking to the board. So yeah, I really like this play from Doctor Hippie. Now we see what Bond is going to bring onto the board and. Yeah, infested Wolf, reasonable. Definitely not bad. And the 3-3 is going to end up not having a big impact here, but you know, back-to-back -back Ancient of Wars is going to make a huge dent in Lycabouse's pressure here. He's going to have to fight through this uh, pretty much the hard way unless he gets some significant help from Animal Companion on the next turn. Yeah, and also just to rewind a little bit, the Mulch did give Eternal Sentinel, which as a hunter is not what you're looking for. You want anything of high value because you lack card draw, mm -hmm. so you want every single card you're going to get into your hand to have some form of greater impact than a 3-2 for 2 mana. Like, so it was pretty unfortunate with the Mulch, I'd say. There. Strictly worse than Bloodfen Raptor. Yes, yes, unless there's... Is there any way... No, there's no way for, there's no way for Hunter to overload, right? I'm sure in a game where Yogg-Saron exists, we can there's invent a way. a way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the Argent Horse Rider in hand as well is going to help do some damage, but at the moment, there just needs to be a kill command. Call the Wild, great card, but not enough. So we banking on Huffer. Uh, so yeah, Leok would add three and allow him to yeah only push his eight. But now the horse rider, yeah, it's actually probably a better outcome than Huffer, um, because he you know he gets to keep the large body of the animal companion itself in play. Whereas if it was Huffer, True. the Huffer would be trading in itself. So yeah, I think Leok is actually the the best option here. Yeah, and now uh, like a boss hopes against hope that there's no swipe, as that was that would uh, lock out this board pretty rough, but. Fortunate for him, Dark Tippy has just drawn into Fandral and not a lot to really combo with Fandral this turn. And by not a lot, I mean actually nothing mm -hmm. uh, because he can't play Ancient of War as well. So it also feels kind of bad to just Ancient of War on a board this, this big, even though it looks quite unthreatening. So it kind right. of does a lot of damage, you know, yeah. out of nowhere. I don't mind just dropping Fandral here. You know, Fandral and being able to hero power as well this turn almost contests Kill the board the just as well as the as the the seventh the, the five ten does. And then you have the potential for the ten ten Ancient of War next turn if in Miracle World Fandral sticks. And then plus you get another hero power alongside the seven drop next turn as well. So you're weaving in just those those two extra little increments of value over the two turns. Yeah, I, I completely agree actually because Fandral will be um, if you kill the Leoc, then the, the Hunter's one damage off killing it just based mm -hmm. off minions. And Hunter like Unleash, which he only runs one of in the list, you know, to actually cleanly kill it. Or if not that, then burn and you're using, you're following up with Ancient of War, right? So any burn used on Fandral is kind of a bit of a win for you in general. 
Yep, quick shot, very important oh, draw perfect. for like a boss to be able to clear through this. And again, the Leoc perseveres here. He's able to uh, to stick the Animal Companion oh, on the board. And there is the tactics. first emote from Like a Boss. I think you will uh, hear a little bit more about Like a Boss's stance on emote usage in Hearthstone as we as we progress through this series. But he is uh, definitely a subscriber to the the tactical side of emotes, as you said, which is something that uh, I remember Hoy writing a, an extensive article on after he made his breakout performance in Via Game about you know actually using emotes to, to bring your opponent out of the mindset that they're locked into yeah. on any given turn. Yeah, and let's be honest, you know, a lot of players are like, you know, you shouldn't emote, it's disrespectful or, mm -hmm. you know, BM. But like one, like a boss is like one of the nicest guys I've ever met. <laughs> but also you take, you use the tools available in the game to, to your advantage. Yep. If that's what you want to do, there's completely nothing wrong with it. And Dark Tip is going to go for the swipe into the Fandral. And at this moment in time, the, the wild growth will probably be the decision follow up or because of this call of the wild do you think is hippie played enough spells for yog to be good enough like a boss says thank you for that perfect trade and as if to answer your question alexander bagley <laughs> he has played five, five. spells yeah. this game oh arcane giant i love the card and it has the additional joy of counting spells for us it, it is pretty useful yeah it's it says so it, it counts the exact number of spells for you until it gets down to zero then, at which point your number of spells is enough yeah good it's yeah. like it'll do so now the problem is though that there's the fear of if you just play giant and wild growth well, wild growth and giant in the uh probably the correct order there, mm -hmm. you're going to just fear the second call of the wild because there, there aren't enough spells to get to, for Yogg to get worked on. You know, let's be honest, five no. is just not really enough. No. But, you know, the, the swing of a second call is extremely scary. So I actually don't mind Dr. Hippie playing this. And Hippie actually told me yesterday that he likes Yogg because they're always good. So I said, right, we're casting your game tomorrow. We'll see. And so far, okay. <laughs> That it is so good. ambitious, and he actually nourished for mana here, so he's actually able to now cycle through that wild growth if he wants to, and That's discount, it. and that is Five absurd. was enough, and there's Hippie, not normally showing too much emotion on camera, but he cannot help himself, and you know what? It's very scary when someone tells you my yogs are always good. First yog, good, on five spells. Oof. I, it's what, totally what, speechless, what, eh? Yeah, Can everyone yeah, just yeah. take a note? This is the first time in my history of knowing you that you're speechless. What just happened? <laughs> that was five spells. All right, so wild growth available can cheapen, uh, can reduce the cost of his arcane giant, but not by enough to fit in the violet teacher as well, I believe, right? So we'll go down to yeah. five, so it'll be one mana short. So, yep, just gonna cycle it out first. Living Roots is a nice pickup here, allows to clear out the four three off the board, allows him to push seven face and develop a fresh eight eight alongside this board, so. All of a sudden, from a you know a precipice situation, he is now set up lethal. Yeah, and we said from the beginning, Hunter overruns the Druid, but now with no you know no minions on the board, one card per turn, and this kind of power on the other side, this is this game is pretty rough. I mean, he called the wild best card he could have drawn. Is it enough? Probably not. It's enough for now, but in the long term, it, it begs another question. But it. It speaks very much to the power of Call of the Wild as a card that we're even considering whether that one draw is enough to have yeah. brought him back into this game now because he was so far behind up until this point. I mean, any other card would just be game, right? Yep. There's literally no other card yep. I don't think he could have drawn, especially because he only had one left in the deck. So like a boss having a, a, a chance at coming back into this game after that pretty powerful Yogg from Duck Tippy. Is like a boss considering hitting face here? I mean, is, I is that the necessary play, actually, to, to give yourself a no chance? No kill commands and one quick shot. Mm. So, yeah, quick shot like into this. kill command. Well, just kill command if Leoc survives. Right. Oh, uh, no, because he'll hero power. Well, never mind. He, play, he played to his outs. Like, I, I definitely don't mind this line. Of course, you know, basically any removal spell was lethal there with the line he took, but I don't think he wins the long-term trading game ever. You know, it seems like a 0% line to, to go down the trading game from there, but... 
He, he takes the aggressive push, tries to put uh, set up an out for him off the top of his deck, but any removal spell and Wrath yeah. was good enough. And Dr. Hippie, the experienced veteran of these proceedings, is uh, going out to a healthy lead. Yeah, he's definitely not roping the turns, which is a bit of a surprise in itself, but we'll be back in just a minute with the continuation of the series of Dr. Hippie versus Like a Boss. Для меня это новый опыт, новая страна, я никогда раньше не был в Америке. Новые знакомства, это довольно весело. Happy to be back. So you finished second place last time. Second place. Is this going to be the time where you come back and win? Are you a player that uh, likes to get emotional when you when you play Hearthstone? We know from last season you're a pretty calm player, but ha has anything changed? Do you still think about the game in the same way of just trying to not really let people get into your mind? Even if you win, are you going to cheer? At least a smile. Very quickly becoming the scariest character in Hearthstone. A man, a man after my own heart. I don't think I can, I can add anything to, uh, to increase the brilliance of that interview. Dr. Hippie is just my hero. Yeah, it's such a great character overall. And, you know, Omvertus Pro joined because yep. of a, another champion who is Neyman and, you know, another exceptional player. And the fact that Dr. Hippie's returned, you know, again, he is back here for the second time. It is such an impressive feat considering it's the qualification again through prelims, battling through that huge bracket and then into the top eight all over again. And he's been proving why he's doing it. You know, he's 2-0 up versus like a boss, his first opponent in this top eight. And he's uh, looking pretty steady so far. Yeah, of course, Neyman was the player who, who you know, snatched his dreams away from him originally. Yeah. You know, defeated him in grand finals. And but, you know, instead of instead of salt and misery coming out of that, a friendship was born and, you know, they ended up joining the same team. And, and Dr. Hippie says that one of his big motivations to go to BlizzCon is to compete against Neyman again on the biggest possible stage. Yeah, there is nothing bigger for these players. It is going to be game three beginning now. It's Dr. Hippie's mage, which is not freeze versus like a boss's zoo that we saw earlier on so what is this mage list and what is dr tippy doing has he queued the wrong one sol unfortunately i'm not sure if he's we can say he's queued the wrong mage deck he's just put the wrong cards in his <laughs> mage deck he is unfortunately to my to, to my to my great disappointment is playing double cabalist tome tempo mage yes yeah uh, you, over to the dark side. You actually sat and played some ladder with him with this deck, right? With the with the tempo mage and uh, found out <laughs> some some interesting facts about yeah. Dr. Hippie. So, you know, completely known for his freeze mage pie, of course. Everyone knows this. And I asked him, so, you know, is this the first time you've taken freeze mage to a tournament? And he said, uh, sorry, not taken freeze mage to a tournament. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, yep, first time ever in any tournament he's not brought freeze mage. It's like, okay, so how much, how much of this list have you played? Mm, not really any. I've just brought it because I didn't feel like Freeze Mage was the right fit. And yeah, this looked like like the best list to bring, so right. I'm doing it. And I said, so when was the last time you played Tempo? Yeah, back in that Nax Ramus days, or at least the, the Mad Scientist days. I was like, good luck, Dark Tippy. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> this, this, there is a fine line between genius and insanity, and this decision rides on that line exactly because I mentioned in the previous series that we cast together that I feel like this has been a kind of uh, a meta dictated by the presence of Freeze Mage in the meta on two of the strongest players, Dr. Hippie, George C, both expected to bring Freeze Mage to this tournament. So the genius level of this decision is that Dr. Hippie has swerved everyone. And I asked like about specifically, you were prepared for Freeze Mage, right? <laughs> he said, yeah, 100% thought he was bringing Freeze Mage. So he has you know, at least swerved everyone in that regard, but how wise is the decision to bring a deck that you have so little experience well, with. Well, you know, we're going to find out, and we mentioned this earlier, where I think, you know, Dr. Hippie is an, an exceptional player. There is no questions there. Mechanically, he's very good. Is he good enough to pilot? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> 
Stop right there. That was just smoke missiles. All to face the Voidwalker just 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 chilling. Like a pass does, you know, rock back in his seat. He gets the slightly sad news that his Voidwalker is going to bite the dust anyway. But for a second there, he was living in Dream World as he thought his 1 3 was going to survive. He had the abusive sergeant in hand, which would have been able to come out and pick up a tempo trade on the board. So that would have been a huge deal. And like a pass is now going to cycle one of these cards out with the Soul Fire, just reduce some of this pressure on board right now. And holding on to the knife juggler here is a big deal because he's still going to be behind on this board next turn and could very, very possibly need some strong knives from the Knife Juggler to be able to take out the 3-1 Mana Worm. Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting, the, the Soul Fire on the Apprentice. So the the, the, the Sorcerers can cause havoc in, in this list, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can really, with reduction of uh, spells by one, cause absolute havoc, but your opponent's got one card, goes into two in hand. There's what, like, actual arcane intellect you, you're afraid of after seeing arcane missiles and arcane blasts so yes you know may, maybe the mana worm was the target because yeah. that's going to start stacking up no I, I almost all of the time prioritize sorcerer's apprentice over everything else flame waker is the king that thing has to die but after that sorcerer's apprentice yeah. is next on the list like even over cult sorcerer most of the time unless there is like a particularly insane arcane blast target on the board that you have to get rid of the spell damage for because and before mana worm never dies I mean, it, it, it's just like 18 damage. It's possible, <laughs> I agree. But, you know, you're, as you said, you can look at it from the other perspective and say, you know, your opponent is out of cards. He's had to play a really inefficient turn two because of the arcane missiles yeah. outcome. So don't give them the opportunity to, you know, tempo back into the game by drawing cards cheaply and then, you know, picking up more spells that they can use. You know, just try and wall them out as much as you can. This is almost becoming an attrition game for the zoo now. Yep, and it looks like the Mana Worm will not live too long. It's already the trade from the Flame Waker. So as you said, Flame Waker, like, number one sort of priority card overall in this mage deck, and it's going to die to the Imp Gang Boss. But what this does, the trade actually has a chance of keeping the Mana Worm alive for another turn as well. But, like you said, holding on to Juggler, it's mm -hmm. going to be a big deal depending on where this first juggle goes. I'm not yeah, sure I like not... this sequencing. Why was... Hmm... Yeah. Okay, so that seems a little bit off. The extra damage for the Imp Gang Boss was uh, insignificant because you're going to trade it into the Flame Maker anyway. Right. And the juggle from the 1-1 one, one Imp had a, like, there was a chance with the juggle just hits the Flame Waker and then the one damage is wasted. So, what I will say, if you hit your first juggle onto the 2-2 two, two Flame Waker and it then becomes a 2-1 Flame Waker, you can then continue to develop minions and you then have two targets on the board, right? That you have a 66% chance to shoot a one health yeah. minion. Um, which is valid. Um, so it, it, it's pretty close, but as you said, I mean, your your prophecy is coming to fruition right now. That mana worm has that mana worm has seen things. It is still here, kicking around, and it's probably going to be forced to pick up a trade here because Doctor Hippie's hand, after starting very aggressively, has fizzled out here, as the deck tends to do when you build it this heavily. So he has had to very quickly switch himself to a control game now. Yeah, and you know he does have the tools going forward for that as well. The, the like a boss is out of cards. Obviously, he's a warlock so he can just tap into extra cards anyway. But Dr. Hippie can go into Emperor this turn if he feels like it, because the trades would require the 4-3 the and the 2-1 to go into it, so it clears a good chunk of the board anyway. And then follow up with the, the Paul as well, which is actually a big swing card in itself. Yeah, Firelands Portal could potentially be huge here on the follow-up if he's able to get a good defensive outcome. And, you know, in this situation, good defensive outcomes include things like Doomguard because that's just, <laughs> yeah, it's a two-for-one removal spell, essentially, right? So he's able to pick up, you know, a nice Taunt minion, which there are a good number of from Firelands Portal, or a Charge minion that can, you know, two-for-one on removal immediately. Then that could be a big swing, especially since he'll be able to drop it alongside Cult Sorcerer to try and pick up some additional tempo on the next turn, so... Yeah, I just like the Emperor here. I mean, that there's a chance there's a fireball into ping is, is considered just to clear up as much of the board as possible, but I feel like playing the Emperor kind of does that job for you. Yeah, it's it's very, very possible that the, the Emperor picks up a, a two for one trade anyway. This this deck, you know, he's already seen an abusive, uh, I think was it was Direwolf discarded? Is that the card that was discarded off the Soulfire initially? I don't quite remember. No. But you know, he's seen some buffs being used already. Of course Argus as well is already on the board, so there's a lot of potential buffs out the window and he doesn't play uh, power overwhelming in the list, so that's you know one of the biggest tools out the window.
Yeah, that opens up for the trade-ups that Zoo is normally known for. Maybe it used to be known for Matt, now because it's all about the cycle with the discard mechanic. And Dr. Hippy now draws into the Azure Drake, so opens up the chance to play that plus ping. But I still feel like it's either Emperor or Phylons. I don't know. Could Phylons onto the 1-3 just to mm -hmm. remove that as a threat? Oh, for the sake of one power, you kill the Imp, surely. Yeah. I I definitely disagree with this one. Nexus Champion Serad is a tool that if it survives is going to be a big deal, but it's not going to survive oh. because there are both options in hand now for Lagabas. The Soulfire is going to get discarded, and yeah, for for the difference of one power between such a huge tool in the Malkazar's Imp and the Defender of Argus, I'm not sure if I can get on board with Dr. Hippie's decision there. Yeah, it's what we were talking about earlier. You know, it, they're the chances, it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice, they're, right. they're, they're the chances that allow the Zoo to get back in the game if you feel ahead or continue to push. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we got an Argent Squire from it, so we've got a 1-1 Divine Shield from that Imp staying alive versus the one damage that, you know, he would have ex like took extra, but he'll just take the damage from the Squire now. Yeah, and now the the tempo mage is is so far behind in this matchup. Now it's not it's not a matter that can be redeemed, you know, just by a couple of one for one removal spells. And this list, it's running one Firelands portal as its seven mana removal tool that we just seen use, and zero copies of Flame Strike, zero large scale AOE at all. So he's going to need some probably some Cabalist Tome miracles to fight his way back into this game. Yeah, there's also because he has the Cult Sorcerer, there is an Arcane Explosion in the list that's as true. well. So yeah. that's one of the sort of snapbacks he can he can draw just to be able to reset the board, especially because the Doom Guard is at the moment on two health. So, you know, there is something he can do there with a, just a lot of spell power and a big Arcane Explosion. Might be enough, but there's only one. So he has to draw it first. Yeah, he does have the Drake to cycle an additional card. And yeah, with the amount of spell damage he has available to him, I mean, I'm sure... And the Thanos is going to draw too. Yeah, the, the Thanos is going to draw, so I'm sure it's going to go down and not remain as spell damage here. But he has two spell damage minions in his hand, so his, his capability to just sweep this board next turn. It, there are two three health minions, and the rest are less than that. So if Arcane Explosion is drawn here, this is going to be him. huge! Woo! Okay. Dr. <laughs> Hippie is a man destined for BlizzCon. I am calling it now. Oh, he even has intellect. He definitely does uh, have intellect. He <laughs> does have intellect in the card sense and the general sense as well. Arcane Explosion, the one card, I believe, in the deck, other than, you know, Arcane Explosion from a Kabali Stone, yeah. would have been enough to at least just secure it. And now, like a boss, is on the back foot out of nowhere. Another Drake, Frostbolt, one mana Cult Sorcerer. Dog Hippie pretty much has everything he needs to finish this game up. And I, like that draw is so huge because we both feel if there's going to be a weak point, if there's something holding Dr. Hippie, who is one of the favorites in this tournament, if there's something holding him back from taking his seat at BlizzCon, it's this Tempo Mage yeah. decision, right? It's can you pilot this deck at this level without mu that much experience? And I, I mean... Uh, that, that Arcane Explosion draw sure does help patch over some cracks. Yeah, 100%. And now, you know, Dr. Tip is taking his time to really think about it. As you said, if he closes this game out, one, he's only one game away from closing the series out, yeah. and also gets the Temple Mage out of the way. But he has so many options. The second Intellect as well. These Drakes and Arcane Intellects have done so much work lethal. in keeping him in the game. And never mind, he doesn't need to think about any of that. It's when you draw into Frostbolt that do five damage, you're looking pretty nice. Yeah, when you are chilling with that much spell damage in your hand, uh, it does not take a lot to burst down Zoo and Dr. Hippie here goes to the hill. Like a boss is going to have to draw inspiration from anywhere he can. The trophy, his daughter, the Greek community, he needs all of it right now. Yeah, and we're going to find out if Like a boss can claw his way back into this series right after this. I, I want to know a little bit more about Like a Boss outside of Hearthstone. Do you have anything that you enjoy doing in your spare time besides play Hearthstone? The perfect time is like when I play with my daughter and she's smiling at me. That's the best free time I can have. <laughs> oh. Don't cry. <laughs> oh. I, I joined the army one year and a half or something, and then my girlfriend told me that uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have a baby and. In the, in the start, it's like, whoa, 
what I'm going to do. I don't have a job. I don't have anything. Imagine that I finished the army and I haven't even seen her with, uh, with her belly. So as soon as I, I left the army, they, they just gave me a baby like, here, you finish the army, take a baby too. <laughs> <laughs> but in the beginning I was afraid, uh, but now it's like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. And she's always helping me in, in top decks and everything. So uh, would you say that if you won the championship, it would, it would mostly be for your, for yeah, your family? Yeah, it, it, it will be for her and for my girlfriend, for sure. Is Amelia going to play Hearthstone when she's, when she's old enough to, uh, to click some buttons? I hope not, because she's going to win me. <laughs> she's going to beat you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lagerboss has been on one hell of a journey so far and he's going to really need to dig deep and get some inspiration from his family to be able to claw his way back into this series as that last game was, I mean, I'm glad we, we just had a moment there to just calm down because that was crazy. It was. Yeah, he Lagerboss mentioned that he feels like his daughter brings him, him good luck in Hearthstone. So I'm, I'm wondering after that last game in particular whether Dr. Hippie has a daughter somewhere that he doesn't know about <laughs> that's bringing him good luck. It's possible. <laughs> It's going to be a very strange good luck charm. I don't yeah. recommend this for everyone. No. Uh, definitely something just to consider, though. But, yeah, the series overall is looking a little bit rough. And Dr. Hippie, on the back of some very fortunate moments, has uh, managed to go up 3-0 so far. And as we mentioned just before we uh, had a minute there, the Tempo Mage is gone. Mm -hmm. So that was the worrying deck. And we were all realistically worried about, as I said, when I was sat with him, he told me he just not played the deck yeah. that much before, even at all. So you're a brave man. You're a brave man. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to discredit him at all. He's an amazing player, and you know, 66% of his wins have come off his back. But he was just dead that game yeah. without that arcane explosion draw. So it was, it was huge. And you know, it's, it's a, it is a skill-based video game, believe it or not. But sometimes, if you are going to make the big push, you do need that little bit of luck in the right place. And that's exactly what he picked up. Yeah, 100%. And it looks like Dr. B has his warrior left as well, which is a bit of a different one which feels strange to say compared to the rest of the warrior list we've seen at the moment. It's going to be good old-fashioned Dragon Warrior. Yeah, what? What kind of crazy <laughs> meta are we playing in this tournament where good old-fashioned <laughs> hit-you-in-the-face Dragon Warrior is the breath of fresh air as far as the warrior decks go? A very strange one is my answer. Yep. But the first deck like a boss has chosen to go up against this warrior is going to be his Hunter. And I know it, I pre I'm pretty sure like a boss does, does quite enjoy Hunter as a class. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to him quite a lot about it yesterday in terms of just different builds, different slight styles, variations. So I feel like he's going with a comfort pick at least because he has to win every single game versus this Dragon Warrior to be able to take the series. He absolutely does. And this is a, a matchup that there's there's quite a lot of disagreement on, honestly, as to who's who's favored. You know, s sometimes you get that annoying answer of, well, if the Warrior gets Fiery War Axe, they're favored. It's like, no, that's that's just not how matchups work. Yeah. Like, on average, who's favored? Um, but it, it really is a snowbally matchup, right? Yes. It comes down to who grabs the board early. And with like a boss's particular list, where he has the extra, you know, Argent Squire plus Abusive Sergeant package in there as well. He probably has more tools to be able to do that early than the Dragon Warrior does that plays, you know, a lot of, you know, fairly clunky mid to late game minions. But having said that, Dr. Hippie has a pretty quick draw of his own available to him. Yeah, and I think Hippie as well has the Twilight Guardian, which is one of the breakers in this match, because I, I think that it's so awkward for the Hunter to deal with that six health. It's never clean with just a kill command. Mm -hmm. It really requires deadly shot, if you have it, to just keep up the tempo and keep pushing. Or you have to just commit like a minion plus dead, uh, plus uh, kill command, sorry, or a minion plus quick shot, and then that really slows down your turn. Yeah, sure does. But for now, like a boss is curving out uh, ahead of his opponent here. So Dr. Hippie will need to play catch up and he doesn't have that fiery war axe to be able to do it. He does have Ravaging Ghoul available to him. And I think this choice of development here is you know somewhat with uh, Ravaging Ghoul in mind because you can see the Ravaging Ghoul will punish his 2-1. So the choice here between the, the Grandmother and the Huge Toad, this means that he keeps a 3-2 on board after the Ravaging Ghoul as opposed to a 3-1. Yeah, it's uh, looking pretty good so far. And it's if Dr. Hippie even chooses to play the goal. Uh, yeah, I don't think this yeah, is the Yeah, I was, was going to say, because now he has a few more options. I mean, I definitely don't think the frothing is a good idea a lot of the time. But, I, you know, the monkey seems okay here. 
Yeah, Monkey definitely... Monkey and Frothing essentially do a similar job in this situation, so it's kind of which do you value more later. And Dr. Hippie actually is going to play the Ravaging Ghoul here just to immediately contest, but just going back to the point, it's about which do you value later. Do you want to keep the Frothing so you can make an aggressive push later, or do you want to keep the Fierce Monkey so that you can be defensive yeah. later and potentially, you know... War uh, Hunter, it talked about the power level of Call of the Wild specifically before, but because that card is so powerful, it also makes them quite linear going into turn eight, because you know that's the only thing you're scared of happening, yeah. right? Call of the Wild. So sometimes having specifically a taunt minion, you can make their play even more linear by saying, right, this is where your Huffer has to go. It yeah, has no line option. It up perfectly, yeah. And that's why a lot of the time, you know, we saw it in a, the, one of the previous games with Like a Boss. If you can force a setup before Call of the Wild with minions that are probably going to stick, then you definitely, you know, you definitely go for it uh, you, given the right situation. And we just saw then Like a Boss trading into the Ghoul, which is pretty much what he wants to do because he, he did draw the second Toad. But as we said earlier, it, this is a snowball matchup. Mm -hmm. So you do trade. A lot of the time as Hunter, you just be aggressive and let your opponent go into you. But you do definitely trade here to be able to keep head on the board. Because if Warrior sticks on the board, normally the minions are just bigger than yours. So it's a real problem. Ooh. Whiff. And that's a bad bond. Um, okay, Toad. The, you've got yeah, some work to do. Huge Toad, it's all on you, buddy. Oh. Nope. Uh, yeah, he could have he could have chosen to go Animal Companion there instead of Barnes and given himself the extra 33% outcome from Leoc to be able to, to trade up effectively, but probably not worth it in the long run. That is a uh, you know pretty much the the bottom tier of outcomes he could have had from his you know his two checks that turn first the Barnes check and then the 50-50 on the huge toe just about as bad as it could have gone. Yeah, and also as well just the just the sheer playing off curve when he has Animal Companion plus Toad next turn. You know, it's a pretty good follow up in that we see. This sort of uh, the the worry of the Twilight Guardian coming down now, and suddenly the board's starting to just spiral a little bit out of control for like a boss here. Certainly is, and like you said, that three six is just such a big <laughs> it's deal. It's so awkward. Such an annoying minion for them to deal with. You know, not only in this mid game period, but it's also just amazing for exactly that that late game Call of the Wild <laughs> situation, right? You just play a three six into their Call of the Wild turn. It's like, oh well, my five two Huffer is kind of sad right now. Yep. The Leoc doing some good work though means he can clear off the Twilight Guardian this turn. And you know, don't really care about the monkey at three one compared to the six health of the Twilight Guardian. Yeah, for sure. And he, he absolutely deserves that outcome after the last. You know that. That, that, that Everything even, went wrong. That evens out a little bit, you know, what happened on the last turn where he got, you know, a bad outcome from his Barnes and then missed on the huge toe 50-50 as well. So Leox serving out some sweet, sweet animal companion justice there. Oh, and allowing like him to, see. to trade into that annoying 3-6 that we were talking about. But Dr. Hippie has, you know, secured the early game here. He's, he's navigated the early game turns at least. He's still a little bit behind on the board, but having now drawn Curator as well, his ability to go late with this Dragon Warrior deck is so huge exactly yeah like a boss at this point it's generally around turn five or six as hunter that you really have to start thinking about what resources you have available because it's normally not a lot and work out how to get the most out of them because as we can see the warriors just already got way more cards mm -hmm. and as you mentioned curator only helps <laughs> it's only going to refill yep. and cause even more problems and pretty much like a boss is going to want either a tracking or a call the wild coming up soon maybe even a high main will be enough because he currently is ahead on board so a high main would help cement that but other than that every other draw in his deck would feel a bit lackluster sure I think that was a perfect uh, sequencing of attacks there from Lyka Baus as well. There's no need to fully respect the Drake. This is probably the only deck in Hearthstone that plays Azure Drake that you don't have to respect Azure Drake to actually be like a destructive source of spell damage. So he didn't need to kill it. But if he'd have just sent both of his attacks face, then the Drake comes back into the Leoc, and then suddenly your kindly grandmother only has one power, so it can't complete that trade. It can't it can't force it to happen in the end. So I like his decision to do the halfway play here, make sure that if that Drake trades into anything on this board, it's just going down immediately, and also just maximize his pressure on the board for the next turn. Yeah, now, you know, it's looking like Lyka Boss does have a good amount of minions on board. The Unleash not really going to do too much work, maybe depending on where this Toad goes. But it's just, a fiery bite. It's just not what he needs. It's not enough. No, like we said, it's just it's just not going to be enough. It might he might be okay for one more turn, and he can allow himself one more draw. But you know, if he continues to whiff this hard, it's you know, Dotty is just going to outvalue him at this point. 
Yeah, he absolutely is. The one thing that's worth saying about Dr. Hippie's list is that he doesn't uh, play Deathwing, which is a, a pretty recent I mean, not recent, but it's a, it's a later development in the Dragon Warrior list after yeah. it was being refined. Um, so if Lycabas can kind of keep this wide board built up against the Dragon Warrior, it's hard for them to deal with, especially after he's used one of his Ravaging Ghouls already early on in the game. His only. Oh, Ravaging you're totally goal. right. Yeah. yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> he, he has used his Ravaging Correct. Goal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh, it's a real tough one. And, you know, suddenly these one health minions are you know, just about enough to stick to the board at the moment. But I just like Curator because there literally needs to be a burn draw or a Call of the Wild to deal with it efficiently. I don't hate double frothing. It potentially trades down this entire board anyway if you can put the, the fear into your opponent to be able to do it. I think that gives you the, the best platform to be able to, 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 to fight back from long term. It's again, it's just as weak to Call of the Wild, but yeah. you cannot be a Call of the Wild draw here. Hmm. Animal Companion's not terrible though. Telfast, that's what, 6 13. All face. You've seen a ghoul. The frothing is the frothings are not going to ridiculously buff this turn, and then you know smack them back for 27. I just like all face here. You need to end this game soon. Sounds like a plan. Yes. Let's do it. Send it all downtown. It looks like that's what's happening. And as you said, the one ravaging ghoul. These lists are revealed, so like a boss will know that the one ghoul is the only ghoul in the deck, and that it's already been used. So he knows not only. Is, is this board more likely to stick because the Ravaging Ghoul is there, but also the threat of double frothing is not a real threat no. because it's not going to get out of control in just one turn. Yep. Now, Dr. P has what's potentially the last turn of this game to consider how he wants to try and combat this threat from like a boss, but you know, there are still so many cards he could draw now. He's still got some burn. Quick shot, for example, would be kind of brutal here as it would be his only card, so he can cycle as well as dealing three damage. And, you know, there's still the hero power just pretty much negating the hero power of the warrior here as well. So it's going to be a tough one at this point, I think. Kyore is just the play. It's the only play, yeah. He does get himself Safinly as well off of this. Hasn't drawn it yet, so he will get the full three-card package here. But it's a, it's a question of whether he wants it on this board because it's valuable as a 1-3 in this situation. But if he doesn't pick up Priest, for example, as yeah. a replacement, yeah. then suddenly the hero power clock just gets even oh, faster. There it is. Never mind. Like a boss, look at the relief. Woo. I mean, he was very, it was, like a boss was ahead for pretty much all game yeah. there. But the second you run out of juice as a hunter and you know your opponent's got so many cards available, that can snowball backwards very quickly. But the quick shot was enough to finish the game regardless of the taunt. And like a boss, is beginning his comeback attempt. He certainly is, and he was like you said, he was ahead that game, but he was ahead on a tightrope. If that if that animal companion draw was another whiff, if that was Argent yep. Squire, say, then suddenly he would have been in a world of pain. And still, there was the possibility if there was a couple of draws just without direct damage there at the end, then potentially the warrior could have climbed back in. So, really important game. Like a boss, so much riding on this for him, and he is putting himself back in with a shot on the road to BlizzCon. Yeah, and we're going to see how this series continues to play out right after this. So, um, are you and in, in Naaman close? You know, he, he beat you in, in winter. Отчасти благодаря зимним чемпионатам мы с Наймоном очень сдружились. Он мне очень помогает со всем. То, что он меня выиграл в финале, никак не сказалось на дружбе. Does he ever bring it up in conversation? Ну мы хорошие друзья, так что такое случается часто довольно. В принципе, я тоже могу сдачи дать. Я знаю там некоторые фишки. You can't tell me. No. Uh, you beat Naaman at Star Ladder. Does that sort of give you the edge in your mind over him? Naaman doesn't have edge. Naaman doesn't have edge. I'm sure there'll be some Twitter conversations happening right now. But Doc Tippy uh, pushed like a boss 3 0. And now, like a boss returned on that previous game to be able to put a point on the board. 
And now this is the this is the stage where Doc Tippy, maybe not himself, but when you're so far ahead and then your opponent starts fighting back, it's just a, there's just a hint of worry that like please don't reverse sweep me. Yeah, and definitely that those doubts can start to creep in. But he has such a powerful deck to be able to pick yeah. up one more win with. You know, Dragon Warrior has been an absolute staple. It was. It, it feels like it hasn't been around all the time, but the reason for that is that it was such a powerhouse, it was banned yeah. in every single round of every single opponent in every single tournament. But it was there in everyone's lineup for months and months and months. And the reason for that is that it's an incredibly powerful, oppressive, aggressive, consistent deck. And if you need to pick up one win over four games, I'm willing yep. to bet the farm on Dragon Warrior. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And even this matchup as we go into the next game here of Warrior versus Druid is, I feel, a bit of a tough one for the Druid because the Warrior can just choose to be so aggressive. And if Dr. Tippy can get an early enough curve out, the Druid cannot just keep up. It's just not possible. Right. The minions, the Dragon Warrior minions are so chunky that basically every single minion you play just demands premium removal from the Druid deck. And eventually they run out of it. So. Generally, the way that the Druid wins in this matchup is that they get ahead with ramp very, very quickly, or they get a huge swing turn with Arcane Giant and there's no execute in hand. And option A is available to like a boss here who is going to go from Wild Growth into Fandral Staghelm very quickly and then be able to back that up with a Wrath. Yeah, that's definitely looking good for like a boss. Whereas on the other hand, Dark Tape has the slightly delayed start. He does, and like a boss actually chose to anticipate a quicker start from Dr. Hippie. Now, normally coining wild growth when you don't have a three drop or an innovate five drop in play uh, in, in your hand is, is considered fairly unforgivable, but he in, he was anticipating the need to wrath yeah. on his turn two, so he wanted to get the wild growth out of the way so he could wrath Alex Straza's champion on turn two and then just develop his Fandral freely on turn three. Yeah, and I you know what I completely agree. I think that's a completely fair play because as we mentioned, if the warrior can start like starts just curving straight away, then Druid's going to really struggle, and that wild growth would have just sat in hand for for such an awkward time there. Like a boss is playing on point right now. The tempo blood mage on the board. How much health is the minion that Dragon Warrior is going to play on turn three going to have? Uh, I'm going to go for a pretty confident four. That Sotter. sounds about right to me. And remember, Dr. Hippie's list, only one Ravaging Ghoul, two monkeys, two frothings. So four out of five times, the minion that comes down here is having four health and just gets punished straight away by this wrath, if Like a boss even wants to go down that line. Yeah, and... Dark Tip is definitely sat considering this very heavily here. I actually like the Fairy Dragon a yeah. lot, a lot. Well, would you Blood Taker? Hmm? Would you Blood Taker yes. as well? Yeah, yeah, to clear it off. I I feel like anything else, it, 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 if you do this with Thanos on the board, you can just get blown out so hard. And Hippie, what a god, he makes the play. So both these players playing extremely well, just in the first few turns, very thoughtful of what their opponent's deck is and what the potential outcomes are and how they can fall behind if they don't play around those outcomes. Yeah, so Fandral comes out here in a pretty solid position and now the threat at hand for Dr. Hippie, how much does he respect this? I mean, you, you have to respect Fandral Staghelm, but do you respect it to the levels of Corcron Charge mm. plus Fairy Dragon and trade into it? Yeah. It's like Dr. Hippie knows what's in like a boss's hand because the nourish to follow up yep. would have been backbreaking in this game. Right, if, if he'd have just dropped the 3-6 the Twilight Guardian there, we would have seen <laughs> Nourish, which would have, of course, drawn three cards and gained the mana. And then with that immediate <laughs> extra mana that you get from the Nourish, he could have wrathed onto the Twilight Guardian Trade. and then traded in with the Fae. It would have just been an absolute nightmare. So that is an insane level of respect for a four drop to trade your two drop and your charging four drop of your own into it. But that is the level of respect Fandral commands. And these first five turns of this game from both sides have been played at an extremely high level. Yeah, this is uh, not your average ladder game. I'll tell you that. This is some top level Hearthstone. I expect nothing less from players of this caliber. Yep, so Twilight Guardian comes down, contests the six power on the board nicely, and if Lycabalfs wants to make something happen so that these two twos don't all trade, 
then he doesn't really have a development play this turn. He cannot um, get the Arcane Giant to come out here through abuse of the spells just yet. So it's a pretty uh, low impact turn here for Dr. Hippie, but he's just going to choose to to use his Wrath to consolidate his 2-2s two on the board. What do you think about this as opposed to just trading and pushing out an Azure Drake? Yeah, I like it just because it's it's less punishable in general. Like It's very difficult for the warrior to, to deal with both minions. There's going to be uh, no double ghoul, for example, as we've mentioned previously. And you've already seen a Corcoran as well, so there's not a chance for an immediate value trade. And we also saw a very sort of funky turn from Dr. Hippie on turn three to play around the Wrath. Mm -hmm. So you know there's still all the four health minions left in the deck. So if they come out, then you know that you know, you're know sort of threatening those with the minions already. And you have a pretty good follow-up with Azure Drake into Wrath next turn regardless. I like it. And I like this decision from Dr. Hippie as well. Doesn't, doesn't feel the need to overreact to these two twos just yet. He's just going to continue to try and grab the initiative over and over again, right? He's just going to keep trying it until he runs out of ways to do it or until it's, you know, irreversible and then he'll start trying to fight back on board. But he does have to be careful because, as I mentioned, no Deathwing in this list, which yep. means if the board does start to snowball, he does not have that instant reset available to him. Yeah, and again, we see like a boss just, you know, respecting the fact that he wants to keep these two minions alive, the two Trents, sorry, and just continue to have multiple trade options on the board. So we didn't even use, I thought he was going to trade one and use the Wrath to cycle, but with Nourish in hand and then multiple other options yeah. as well going forward, you just don't really need it. You may as well keep the 2-2. Two -two. And like, you know, every single turn played in this game so far is like flawless to the extent of, you know, playing around potential cards in your opponent's hand. It's very impressive. I agree. The Alex Strauss's champion pickup from Dr. Hippie here enables a, a pretty strong turn for him if he does want to choose this turn as a, as a way to fight back onto the board. But it, it would also involve just leaving an Azure Drake up, which is a, a terrifying proposition, but I just don't see anything superior. So this is what's going to happen unless he was going to double trade into the Azure Drake here. We've seen him respect a powerful minion with, uh, with charged minions on a previous turn, but this time Azure Drake Drake doesn't quite command the level of respect yeah. that Fandral Staghelm does. And the thing is here, spell power swipe plus normal swipe, it's pretty much the same outcome. You mean that card? From... Yes, that card. Yeah. That card, like a boss, uh, drew to line up perfectly, and he can play the Arcane Giant as well. Like a boss, literally doing everything right and what he needs to do in this matchup to win it. And Doc Tippy now, unless he plays Rag, and hits the 8-8, he's going to fall too far behind. Yeah, there's no other play. He just has to drop Rag here and just shut his eyes. 33% of the time, he's in a decent position. Taking out the Drake is not terrible as well. Face would just be completely miserable in this situation. And look at Legobulse just summoning the Rag shot to oh, his face. Yeah, face. That is how you control <laughs> this game. Like a boss just, <laughs> just summons the fireball to his hero portrait. And that's just game. And that is going to be the game. Wow, super quick. And the player's playing quite fast to a large extent, considering yep. how much they we could tell they were playing around and thinking of. But like a boss on the road to coming back and potentially reverse sweeping Dr. Tippy. Yeah. And you can see he has been, you know, relatively stoic throughout this series. None none of the histrionics that we saw in the preliminary so far, but you can see yeah. as the stress <laughs> it's is, inside, is, right? is <laughs> ramping up, it's getting there. I'm predicting there is going to be some sort of explosion of emotion one way or the other before this series is through. Yeah, and we will be continuing with this very hype series soon. So stick around, guys, and don't go anywhere. Talk to me a little bit earlier about sort of your strategy behind emoting. Yeah. I'm not going to emote all the game like, yeah, I will hunt you down, I will hunt you down. But I think emotes is there for a reason. The perfect time to emote is like turn eight to nine of the, in the turns that your opponents are thinking how I can clear the board, how I can set up lethal, how I can do that. In the crucial, in the crucial time, you need to emote him. Like even two to three seconds, if they haven't spelled you, they, they get triggered. You get the upper hand there because you get your time, and they might lose the, the the mind and I don't know, do something that they don't want to. I think that's the perfect time to emote. So if you buy yourself four seconds, if you make them stop and squelch you for four seconds, hey, that's four seconds that you bought that yeah, they don't have. Yeah, but I think anymore. that's good. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. yeah.
So we see, you know, the insight into Lycobos's emote strategy. Not something yep. that's discussed too often in Hearthstone, but definitely something considering. Yeah, I like it, honestly. I think, it, like it or not, the, the emote system is a tool that is in the game and is legal. There is no rule against it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you are a competitive player, your job is to use the game mechanics and the rule set that is presented to you and engineer the best possible situation for yourself to defeat your opponent. If that involves annoying them, then <laughs> okay. sure, that's perfectly legitimate because the situation that he's describing there with, you know, you time it at a point where you make them go, oh, why is this jerk emoting me right now? And then they're not thinking about their turn. If you do that, if you get distracted, that's your problem. That's not yeah, theirs. Exactly. You should be focused. And there's a squelch option. There is, yeah. So, you know, there's always that if the players feel they need it. But we are going to get into game six. It's going to be Dr. B's Dragon Warrior third time now versus like a boss's zoo so this again you know we, we were discussing it earlier where the dragon warrior feels like a really good lineup here but this second ghoul that we've mentioned in two series now mm. it feels like a bit of an issue for dr hippie and also it's not the fact of not necessarily drawing the second ghoul but the threat of or, or the lack of threat of the ghoul just not being there and like a boss being fully aware because these deck lists are open for the players Right. The, the card that he's probably playing in that slot, if you like, the Nazos first mate. In this matchup particularly, I have no dispute that Nazos first mate is great. If you can yeah. draw it early, it's a fantastic tool to be able to fight for the board early on. But in so many other matchups, like, I just feel like it's such a low power level card overall in terms of its impact in a game, especially if you, you know, don't have it in your hand before turn three, which is pretty likely. And that the the second goal for me just has a, a, a much bigger impact on a lot of games. Yeah. You see like a boss now getting off to a pretty quick start himself, the possessed villager, followed by the imp friends, being able to just go into the board there and not really a good response so far from Hippie. He does have the opportunity to coin out a four drop next turn. And this is the question he's got to ask himself. Does he want Fairy Dragon now? Or does he want to be able to coin out Twilight Guardian guaranteed as a three six taunt? Yeah, this is a really awkward draw for Dr. Hippie right now because of that reason. The, the Twilight Guardian will be huge coming down next turn, but he feels like he has to contest the board right now. He's going to get the bad news that Direwolf Alpha is going to absolutely crush that Fairy Dragon. And this game is already... Yeah, look at that! Like a boss just waves goodbye <laughs> to his opponent on turn three of the zoo game. There we go. This is when he's feeling pretty good. And to be honest... With, this, with the second M coming down there, you know, Dr. Tippy must be terrified now because if there's any draw, you know, any discard mechanic going right. to kick in next turn, you see that your wallet's cycling for two and not even having to pay life or mana. He's just using a spell he would use regardless or he uh, won't be able to use a minion because of the Doom Guard, but even a Librarian coming down. Yeah, unbelievable. And I just, I just struggle to see a way back into this game. The, the, the Nizos first goal. mate pickup is a big deal. This is probably just about the last turn where it could have been relevant. So he does fight his way back onto the board just a little bit, but already this board is contested by what he sees, plus the addition of one of the most irritating minions in the game in you know early board focused matchups, the Imp Gang Boss. He is so far behind. And also, here. just that draw for like a boss. Imp Gang Boss was almost always coming down that turn. Yeah. Almost always. Just draws a one drop. Yeah. Let's just fill the curve out. Who needs life tap? Just draw Doom Guard next turn, it's fine. That sounds like Zoo 101 <laughs> to me. Dump your hand, draw a Doom Guard. That yeah. is how you win some games of Hearthstone. Yeah. And now Dr. Tippy does have the Dragon Activator for his Twilight Guardian, which I think is just going to have to be enough. I, I sort of half considered the Corcoran, but you don't really do it. If you trade into the Gang Boss, then you're only stopping one power. You could Corcoran and trade with the weapon into both of the Malkazar's Imps, which actually like gives you the lo like it gives you the most efficient trades over two turns yeah. because if you trade into the in gang boss like you said it's only taking one power off the board and then you leave your uh Corcoran elite exposed to a one damage attack coming back the other way so i think this is the the optimal line from dr hippie but just not enough and like a boss honestly he could direct this attack in any direction he sees fit in this situation he's so far ahead and when you have that choice I always like to live the smart life, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any direction, I choose face. Um, but, you know, did choose to trade, so be a little bit conservative. And I think the idea for like a boss is 
He's just going to say, I'm not going to get too silly. Now, you know, I'm so far ahead. Now I can just live tap going forward. I'll just remove his Corcoran and then build on that. But mm -hmm. I feel like even if the Corcoran went into the Flame Imp, then, you know, the Imp Gang Boss is just chilling as a 3-5 anyway. So. Yep. And the I'm sure we'll see the coin being used here, the, the yeah. Twilight Guardian and the Alex Strauss champion coming down here, just trying to reduce damage as much as he can, but he still just hasn't even able been able to get back to, to board parity yet, let alone fight his way up ahead, and he just doesn't have the life total to play with right now. You know, one power card from Like a Boss is all it's gonna take. One Doom Guard, one Soul Fire, that will probably be backbreaking, but that is as close to a complete whiff as Zoo can possibly have. Yeah, this is the, the chance Dr. Tippy coming back, but he will need a minion of his own or some kind of card draw because the Dracona Crusher is not going to be enough, I feel, this turn. And he gets the Ghoul, which only removes one power it's off just, the that's, board. I mean, that's just not enough, right? Mm. He gets to armor alongside it, but I think, you know, the winning line here, you know, the 1% yeah. of the time you win this game, it starts with playing a 6-6. Six, six. And there's five damage now available for like a boss and one of the times you're probably not too fussed about playing the silverware goal in this turn just because it's like, yep, yeah, I'll just stack the board out and really, really reduce the chances for Duck Tippy to take this game as he's now put to two. And there's just not a lot he can really do about it. Corcron Elite. So he can take four power off the board or, or three power off the board with the Dire Wolf and the Void Walker. He can then Ravaging Ghoul to reduce another one or he can Hero Power to gain another two. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not yeah. seeing it. No. <laughs> This is looking pretty rough to the extent where it looks like like a boss has evened it up. I honestly did not see this coming. Did we curse Dr. Tippy by saying, you know, three games with Dragon Warrior should be fine. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the, the fortitude of a man who is on the brink of elimination in the biggest game of Hearthstone of his life, who still has the guts to wave goodbye to his <laughs> opponent in turn three of a game. That is playing Hearthstone like a boss. Yeah, nice. So we are going to find out how this crazy series is going to end right after this. So don't go anywhere. We are back with what is going to be the final <laughs> game of the day. Sorry, right. just, just take <laughs> a moment to let that image speak for itself. Like, look at that. There you go. That's moment the, taken. Yeah, there's, there's the moment, so all, all yours. But yep, yeah, it is going to be like a boss versus Dark Tippy, the final game of the series. And this has been an emotional one for me, never mind the players. Dark Tippy went 3-0 F three zero up extremely fast. Yeah. And then like a boss has, like you said, just had the fortitude to just come back into the series and it evened it up. And I'll be honest, no matter what happens with this game, you know, his family should be proud of this performance because that is a very difficult thing to do, especially against a player of the caliber of Duck Tippy. For sure. The, his, yeah, his family, the Greek community, everyone should be pr proud of his performance for sure, but it's not over yet. There is still a long road ahead of him. Even if he wins this game, the road is not over. Yeah. This is this is the first series exactly. for him of this tournament. But, so. but suddenly, the pressure is completely reversed. Even though Dr. Hippie has what is probably now the strongest matchup for his deck that he has remaining out of the four that you know were available to like mm -hmm. a buzz, this is the one that's probably the most difficult for him to win. The pressure, the pressure situation is completely flipped on its head because Dr. Hippie, you know, the players are sat just away to our left a little bit here from where we're sat. And after that Tempo Mage game where he went 3-0 up, Dr. Hippie just turned and smiled at us yeah. as if to say, yup, I, I got this. Um, but now, no such thing. He is looking just as concerned about the situation as like a boss is. And this is the kind of start that Dr. Hippie has been yeah. dreaming about for the last three games. Turn one Argent Squire met with Blood to Ica, following up with Fiery War Axe, a choice of three drops, Finley Murgleton. This hand has everything. Yeah, I mean, do you even just Blood to Ica coin Finley here? Yep. You, you have the rest exactly of the curve lined do. up, like, why not? And these choices are going to be pretty interesting here. It's going to be the Hunter, Druid, and the Mage. I think the, the Mage normally feels like the, the go-to most powerful one, especially this early in the game yep. as the most flexible hero power. Hunter is great, you know, midway through the game when you think I'm ahead and I'll use on hero power to close out the game. But did go for the mage, gonna get some good use out of it in this series overall and 
This is just horrible for like a boss. This is savage. There's there's no choice here for like a boss as apart from to go for the uh, the flame tongue totem to make the value trade. But he is going to be met with the sad sight from his perspective, from his family's perspective, from the entirety of Greece's <laughs> perspective. He's going to be met with the sad sight of a fiery war axe. We've all been there. And Dr. Hippie as well, look at the curve, continues. He has Corcoran, so now his turn four becomes flexible as to whether he wants to play his second three drop or just Corcoran, you know, in, into a minion trade or just go aggressive and go face because one of the strategies as well is if you can be the aggressor against a, an aggro deck, they're going to struggle a lot of the time. And that's why this matchup is so good for Dragon Warrior. Not only do they have these incredible early game draws that match up so well against what the aggro shaman is trying to do, but they are so well situated to just flip the switch and put the aggro shaman on the back foot, which is just not a scenario they're prepared to deal with at all. Yeah, not a chance. And now Dr. Tibby just deciding which three drop he wants to play. Or even if he, he doesn't wants have to, to play no. a three drop this turn, yeah. He can clear, and uh, and he, in clearing, he uses the Blood to Ica, the Mage Hero Power, and the trade from Finley. Correct. <laughs> and he develops a 2 2, so I, I wouldn't even mind that. I think that was a pretty reasonable option overall. I think if you hadn't already seen uh, Flame Tongue Totem come out from oh, your opponent, yeah. then. Um, that, that play would be more attractive because this play that you're making here is a little bit exposed to Flame Tongue Totem. But I think, you know, if there is no buff from your opponent, this play is just, you know, vastly superior. So a little bit of a, of a higher risk line, but, you know, probably very high win rate overall. And now, hmm, which frothing do I pick? Uh, as I feel like whenever you can get a frothing behind a taunt minion, yeah. it's going to be feeling pretty good. You can even clear up the board, buff the frothing as much as possible. And frankly, this is going to have to draw out a lava burst from like a boss. And if he lava bursts the frothing, he doesn't have much room to do much else this turn. He doesn't. It's. I mean, the Argent Squire is nice. That at least lets him develop a couple of minions alongside this, but not the development turn he's going to be looking for here and the hits just keep yeah. on coming for dr hippie here there is no sign of this pressure letting up just yet and you know life tap sure most situations great hero power to pick up but the amount of pressure that he's under here he's only going to be able to life tap so many times before his health total just dwindles away completely yeah and now hippie can just play another froth in use that super flexible mage hero power to ping off the shield and then carry on trading and say have you got a second Lava Burst? Because you're going to need it. This is going all kinds of wrong. And we see like a boss looks extremely tense and rightly so. So he's traded in a way that puts, what, two of his minions onto one health. But it doesn't matter because, I mean, the Maelstrom Portal has an effect here. But if Maelstrom Portal comes out, you are asking for something <laughs> pretty spectacular um, to be able to deal with your frothing as well. Yeah, so. this is just insane. The 1-1 one, one, not going to be enough, and ooh, it's going to be a 12 damage frothing. He even has the Corcoran to remove the whole board. Yeah, this is just so tough. I mean, the Corcoran pushing through yeah. can just go basically anywhere he wants right now. He can but still ping as well. He can still ping, so just protecting the, the value of this frothing berserker right now. And also, this Finley's been putting him some work. It has. He's put in a full shift. Oh, this takes me back. The glory of double figure attack <laughs> frothings hitting face against Warlocks. Oh, the good old days, Raven. <laughs> we miss them. Maybe one day it'll return. But this is looking extremely rough. The Lightning Bolt is going to help like a boss clear up. But he's at such a health disadvantage now. And we can see Dr. P has Azure Drake to refill, continue with the pressure, continue with the card advantage. Ooh. Now he even has Grom. So at this moment in time, Dr. P can say, ah, I can wait for turn 10 if I you know, really need to and just ping yeah, Grom. Just keep pinging face. Yeah. If you want a life tap, buddy, I'm pretty confident <laughs> I'd win that race just by pinging you over and over again if you're going to keep life tapping to draw cards. If you're not going to keep life tapping to draw cards, you don't have the resource resources to contest my board. This is looking like a checkmate situation for Dr. Hippie right now. Feral spirits can stall briefly. It's just not looking like it's going to be enough. No, there's just too much power. And as you said, four turns with the pings. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's like at worst, 
But, you know, we said earlier when Dr. Tippy had his Dragon Warriors, his last deck, he had like what four goes with dragon warrior yeah you normally extremely confident and to be fair it took him the fourth game right. to get a really you know strong opening being able to really hammer home in, yeah. in the matchup do you know what if you get to mulligan four times with dragon <laughs> yeah. warrior one of those times you're gonna hit blood to icker into fiery war axe like it's just going to happen so it took him a while but dr hippie the veteran is gonna get to at least progress through this tournament keep his dream alive of progressing through to his dream match, the rematch against Neyman at BlizzCon. Now that that would be a that would be a sight. Mm -hmm. Be kind of crazy. He does have to finish this match up though, but it's looking very promising so far. Is it just does it, it continues with the help of the Corcoran to just not be enough to really answer Grom? Yeah. And again, well, if the, if the Rock Biter somehow kills off Grom, or you know another mm -hmm. lava burst is drawn, well, guess what? He's just going to ping face yep. and just keep doing it till yeah, the, the only frustration for Dr. Hippie over the last few turns here is that his best play has just used all his mana on each <laughs> yeah. turn, so he hasn't been able to just get that clock and moving. And there we go. Like a boss gives it up. The support of his family has got him this far, but in the end, it's the veteran of Dr. Hippie that overcame the situation. And as I said, he is marching onwards to that dream rematch on the BlizzCon stage with Neyman. Yeah, super strong performance from both players. This is the most tense series of the day going back and forth so much. We can see in the bracket, he, Dr. Hippie will actually face this demon tomorrow along with Jordsy versus I Kill You. So, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm glad it's over now because I need to sit down after that to just calm down. I'm I'm just I'm never glad it's over. I'll happily just sit and cast Hearthstone constantly until the the moment I pass out from exhaustion. But this is a great looking top four for me tomorrow. If I was to pick out four of these players that I would like to have seen head off against each other in the top four, these are the four players that I would have picked out. Couldn't be more excited for tomorrow. Yeah, and we have the winner, Doctor Hippie, over on the fire side with Frodo. Thank you very much, Raven and Sonal. Congratulations, Dr. Hippie, on your victory. The first question I want to ask is just, you know, how are you feeling? That series was really close and intense. What's going through your head right now? Uh, what are you doing now in your head? What is happening now? Tell us, please. I was thinking that I played on Vine 4 Harry Potter. How is that possible? I don't even know. After 3-0. I felt not good after the third loss on Vine, but then everything went well normal. Well, he, after a um, very close call, he didn't think he would win. But once uh, he got to the last game, he realized it's going to happen for him. Yeah, it was pretty close. And I think people really want to see you bring Freeze Mage, but you chose to bring the Temple Mage instead. Did any point you think during the series, oh, no, I made a big mistake. I should have brought Freeze Mage. Did you think at some point that you made a big mistake and brought the Temple не, даже не на момент не задумывалась о том, что нам призам будет лучше. А задумался на счет воина уже, но это уже совсем другая история. He didn't think for a second that freeze mage would be better. He was thinking that about the warrior. <laughs> but then it it worked out. All right, well, congratulations. You're going to day two, and hopefully we get to see you make a deep run again. For now, we're going to do some uh, exit interviews on day number one with the winners, but let's head to the sidebar first for a couple of analysis breakdown what we saw today.